So I'm going to talk to Emily Thornbury, who's both Shadow Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and SAS. She's got quite the following now. Uh, I want to talk about Brexit, about the absolute pig's ear of a mess that this country's in. Uh, I want to talk about the Tories, who have driven the country into a pig's ear of a mess. And I want to ask, what next for the country and for Labour? Islington has a bit of a bad name out there. It's, yeah. it's seen as synonymous with latte drinking, sandal wearing, yeah. champagne socialists, middle class do-gooders. The Labour Party's been overrun with these people. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, what yeah, is yeah. the what what's the real Islington? Well, I mean, the real, part, the part, real Islington is, is is it's both. Yeah. We have Georgian Squares, and we have Priory Green. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the and that's the reason people want to live here as well is they really like the fact that you have people from all over the world, every type of background. Sudan, Sri Lanka, Stockport. Yeah, I mean, just like and every type of person and every type of economic background, and we get on. We all live on top of each other. We mm -hmm. all rub along fine. We have very little green space. This is some of the largest amount of green space I've mm -hmm. got in my constituency. I've got less green space than any other MP in the entire country. Seriously? Yes, seriously. Because I live in this constituency I know. and I didn't even know that. No, we have none. In Islington, you've got some of the richest people probably on yeah. earth. Yeah. But 40% or so of kids grow up in poverty. Exactly. It's like two different exactly. universities. Exactly. The truth is, is that the people who hold a community together tend to be those who serve the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those who serve Islington cannot afford to live here. No. Right? They can't afford to live here and they can't get they can't get social housing. Affordable housing in Islington has to be social housing. So do you get kind of cleaners who live miles away coming in the bus at 4 a.m. in the morning? The primary school to teachers at William Tyndale yeah. did not live in Islington. Well, how and far? They oh, I mean a lot of them kind of commuted from the very edges of Islington, you know, very edges of London, so they would take an hour and a half to get mm. in, an hour and a half mm. to get out. And then they had, you know, these really challenging jobs. Mm -hmm. So it meant that we tended to get very young, very bright and able primary school teachers, but they didn't stay. Mm -hmm. Once they wanted to have kids themselves, mm -hmm. they moved out. And that's the problem. That's the problem. You know? So if you think about, I mean, the housing... I'm sorry, and the council. Uh -huh. You know, council officers tend to be... To council workers tend not to live in Islington. No. They tend to live out. And Islington doubles in size during the day because of all the people who come in to work here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just shows the kind of... It's a very odd community, completely unique. No, completely unique. So, I mean, the housing crisis in a place like this is particularly acute, then? Oh, it's awful. It absolutely breaks my heart, to be honest with you, Owen. I mean, when people come to see me in my surgery, mm -hmm. like 63, 64 people came last Saturday to the town hall surgery, and as each one comes in, I can feel myself saying, I really hope they're not coming about housing, because I can help with practically anything, mm -hmm. but we don't have enough homes. Mm -hmm. We don't have, I mean, we can somehow find the space for thousands of new luxury flats, but we can't build social housing. And we can't build social housing because the government has cut the grant in terms of housing and mm. we just can't build it. And the report's just come out this week, which is showing social housing building under this government has plummeted. Oh, I mean, and it was already low, let's yeah, be honest, under yeah, new no, Labour. No. And it wasn't great. But I mean, the one thing that we did do when we were in charge, it wasn't enough, but we did do up all the social, I mean, like this estate got done up. Mm. You know, we did do up all the housing, all the social housing in the country. We just didn't build any. No. It's because we've got to such an extent, because things have got so bad and there's such lockdown on our housing, it means that we're not able to do anything. And frankly, the only answer is a Labour government. I'm sorry, the, the only answer is a Labour government that is prepared to commit to building social housing. You know, people cannot afford to buy here. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter what your background is. If you're 25, if you're a working class kid or a middle class kid, born and brought up in Islington, there's no way you can afford to buy somewhere in Islington. People cannot afford to buy no matter what their backgrounds mm -hmm. and generations of kids are leaving Islington. You know, you go to the sixth form centre and you see these youngsters and you think, how many of them are going to be here in 10 years' time? Yeah. And then they're not. Yeah, of course. They're not. They're not. There's just, and for people who want to sit down and have a family, they can't, can they? They can't. And you get end up with people stuck at home with their parents. Exactly. And cramps. Housing. I mean, one in four kids grow up in an overcrowded home, yeah. don't they, in London? And exactly. And incredible. when there's no, when there's nothing for kids like here to do, yeah. right, they can't even have their mates over because there yeah. isn't space to have their mates over. To be young and poor in London is tough, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Exactly. And boring. I mean, it is glamorous and it is fun, but you have to have money. Yeah. And if you don't have money, nah, it's tedious. It's not, there's nothing, yeah. Your opposite number is Boris Johnson, the yeah. current Foreign Secretary. I don't know if he will be by the time this video goes out, but yeah. how would you describe Boris Johnson? I mean, he's very ambitious and he's charming and he has kind of turned being an upper-class buffoon into an art form. Mm -hmm. But I do wish that he would spend more time being focusing on... There's a lot of world going on. 
you know, you kind of get the impression that Boris is sort of sitting up at night waiting for Donald Trump's tweets to find out what British foreign policy ought to be. Mm. Really, we ought to have a louder voice in the world. And we ought to be doing that by having somebody with a bit of gravitas who actually is immersing themselves in world politics and thinking, right, the British can make a positive contribution here. Mm. We can talk to this people. Mm. We can do this. We can show this leadership. None of that is happening. I mean, Johnson, he used to be, he used to be a constituent of yours, didn't he? He did. That's somewhat surreal. He did. Surreal. Everybody lives in his um, in the end. <laughs> uh, indeed. Uh, I mean, he, many people felt that he backed Brexit for cynical careerist reasons, like he wrote two different columns, one yeah, back in yeah, Remain. Yeah, I mean, what do you yeah. think about that? Do you think that, above all else, he's driven by cynical manoeuvring? I don't understand the internal workings of the Tory party. Don't I don't. They do. And, uh, but I think that if you look at Brexit, if you look at Boris's behaviour, if you look at Theresa May's behaviour, I suspect that it's all about internal Tory party politics. Mm. It's not them. They talk amongst themselves. They don't talk to Britain, let alone talk to the world. Are they in civil war as a government, do you think? I suspect they probably are, but they're so much better at covering it up than we are. You know, if you just kind of spill coffee down someone's front in the Labour Party, it's on the front page of The mm. Observer. So it actually needs to be much worse to get any media attention at all, to actually be leaked into the media. So mm. the fact that we're getting even a little bit, even an inkling shows that, yeah, yeah, they really are at war. But they have been, I mean, that's what Brexit has been about since the very start. You know, why did Cameron go off to Europe in order to get a better deal? Because of internal fighting in the Tory party. He didn't do it in order to really get a better deal for Britain, but in order to get some sort of deal that could keep his Tory party together. Why did he say he wanted a referendum? To keep the Tory party together to get through the general election, not because he thought that he'd ever have to have one. You know, and so it goes on, and so it goes on. You know, and a year on, they still don't have any idea of what they want to do on Brexit because they can't agree amongst themselves, let alone persuade the British public that what they're doing is a good idea. They can't even agree amongst themselves. I mean, do you think the problem is this country's kind of been thrown into a mess because of disastrous parties and manoeuvring by the Tories? It's reduced us to an international laughingstock, surely. That's what the Tories. I mean, what do you think? Have I we... think that's right. My my message to them is, like, all right, get on with it. Do the best you can with some sort of deal. For heaven's sake, stop fighting. Get yourself a unified position. But do remember the interests of Britain more than the Tory party and whether you're going to be the next leader of the Tory party. Get through that and then do no more harm. Keep the status quo and then let's have an election. Let the grown-ups come in and, you know, and Keir and I and Barry, you know, can, can negotiate this properly. And actually with our eye all the time on safety and security of British people and the economy. And that's what we'll do. And that's what we'll do. And people voted to leave. There was not on that list. And we want this and we want to be out of the European Court of Justice and we want to be... Da, 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 da. No, no, no. So it's all no. up for grabs still, isn't it? In terms of what as far as we're concerned, there's nothing off the table. Mm. Nothing's off the table. What we need to do is negotiate the best deal. Mm. And we've not had anybody negotiating with that at the forefront of their mind until now. We have just had Tories at the forefront of their mind. Either I want to keep hold of my position as leader of the party or I want to be the next leader of the party. That's what it's been about. Isn't the other danger? I mean, Islington is a decisively pro, one of the most pro-Remain mm. parts of Britain. Mm. But other Labour supporting areas go up to Doncaster mm. or Hull, about 70% vote to, to leave. Yeah. They think they've got their country back. They're loving all this Brexit. Yeah. If now Labour's position is at least in the transitional period to stay in the customs union and the single market, That's right. is it dangerous? Some of those people might go, these people are trying to stop Brexit. I don't want to vote for them anymore. Yeah, well, we're not. I mean, the point is we're not. We voted for Article 50, you know, we have accepted that we need to leave the European Union. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, there are a minority of Labour MPs who will fight no matter what, but they are absolutely a minority. You know, I speak on behalf of the mainstream of the Labour Party and frankly, most of our voters who either voted to leave or now accept that we have to leave because of the referendum. But now the question is, what's our ongoing relationship? And that is, you know, we have to make a whole load of choices about that, but we have to do it in a sensible way. Do you feel sorry for Theresa May? Sometimes I do. I mean, is she being held? Why yeah. do you feel sorry for Sometimes her? Sometimes I do. Why do you feel sorry for her? Well, I just look at her and just think, she looks dreadful. <laughs> she looks dreadful. She had a, a referendum. She called for it, wanting to get this great mandate. She got exactly the opposite. And it's as if she's being held hostage in number 10 until they can think of something better to do. Mm -hmm. So on a personal level, I feel sorry for her. On a political level, I think that she is... She's nasty. I think that she is prepared to let other people pay the price. And she 
doesn't try to speak or help the whole of the country. She talks about it, but she doesn't do it. And that, I think, is unforgivable. And, I, I mean, mean, the people here you know, need to have a prime minister who, when she closes her eyes, thinks of people like this. You know, not just the richest and most privileged, but the people who struggle, whose every day is a struggle. Well, when she stood on the steps of Downing Street, when she first became prime minister, that's what she spoke about. She spoke about the people. Yeah, she did, yeah. Yeah, I think she's done bugger all about it. Uh -huh. I mean, she's done nothing about it. You know, it's, you have to judge people by their actions, don't you? I mean, what has she done by way of her actions that's actually helped? Uh -huh. Nothing. Nothing. They are completely inadequate. They are incapable of doing anything domestically, and they're making a hash of things internationally. You know, they can hold on to power as long as they like, but they're going. Their time will come. Do you think they're panicking? Do they seem panicking? Of course to you? they are. Of course they are. They have no idea. I th personally, I think that Brexit is like is the same sort of split as those people. Who, you know, people who studied history remember the Corn, corn Laws. laws yeah. The Corn Laws split the Tory Party. This splits the Tory Party. Do you think they could split apart as a party? A, a literal split. I think they could. I think they could. And I think it's really interesting to see them going through this very crisis of identity that we were supposed to be going through. And yet we've kind of pulled ourselves together, you know, and I stand and watch. And as I say, if it wasn't for the fact that they were in charge of the country at the moment, I'm afraid I'd laugh. <laughs> so that's Emily Thornbury. Lots of interesting stuff. Brexit, Tories, the country, what's going to happen in Britain, Islington. Touched all the bases. Um, as ever, I want to hear your thoughts. Do leave your comments below the line. Uh, subscribe, spread the word, loads of other interviews to come. Do click on some of the ones we've done. We've got some great interviews, but we've got loads to come. And as ever, I'll see you next time.